Well, hello everyone. Hello, good morning and welcome to our latest Bath Life Business Club, a discussion with a magnificent seven new businesses uh, and sponsored once more uh, by our good friends at Mojas Druitt. We'll shortly be speaking with our disparate panel covering all manner of sectors uh, with Simon Hall of Hotel Indigo, Anna Sabine of Cassio Community, Mark Wynne and Fabrizio Costa, Your Playbook, Sammy Burt, Backpack, Simon Rollings at Canned Wine Company, Tim Hegarty, Evershare, and Vicky Smith, Mary Shelley's House of Found uh, Frankenstein. It's a House of Foundation. House of Frankenstein, Frankenstein, uh, the novel which was uh, written by Mary Shelley uh, in Bath. And this is a, a new venture celebrating that. We'll be discussing their new companies, how they're faring, what their prospects are, also what advice they have, having been through these uh, first, first few months and quarters and so on, what advice they have for others. Please send your questions using the Q&A button below. You can ask anonymously but, or add your name to the, the question as you, as you see fit. Of course, if this is being recorded, like all of our, our um, business clubs, and will be available on our Bath Life YouTube channel this afternoon. It's worth having a look at some of those on there. They've become a sort of um, repository for these times. Uh, you know, thinking back what we've all been through, that is some sort of uh, a video diary of those times. We do look forward to being back in real life, of course, like everyone uh, with our business clubs, uh, probably in the autumn, but uh, we'll see how we go. A few uh, pieces from us with Bath Life before we get going. Uh, our next Bath Life Business Club is on May 12th. Um, please also look out for our Bath Life Business Surgeries. Four have been lined up with the University of Bath, including ones on entrepreneurialism, which connects to today really, uh, and retail amongst others. More details soon, and there'll be fascinating sessions. But talking of our unis, uh, and it's really important, and we're absolutely delighted that both universities are, are engaging as, as they are, and increasingly so uh, with us, with the city and so on. Talking about unis, we had a great business surgery with Bar Spa Uni uh, the other week, uh, and here's an update from its business development manager, Tony Stimson, on iStart, which is that, um, if you perhaps recall, that new collaboration project between Baines, uh, Bath College, and both of the universities. Here's what uh, Tony had to say. iStart will provide an integrated skills development, research and innovation, and business incubator space. I mean, that's really, really important. Uh, he didn't say that, I did, uh, in the centre of Bath to support high quality jobs and clean, inclusive growth in a zero carbon, creative and digital world. Really essential. It's, it's currently what's called outline business case submission to WECA uh, for funding. Um, they are, of course, very competent of that. The consortium is seeking assistance from everyone watching today, and we will be promoting it through our own channels, uh, seeking assistance to demonstrate business support for their application. This support is via a display of logos. It's, uh, it's no more than that. It's proof that you are into this idea from local businesses backing it. So after today's session, we'll send an email that's from uh, Bath Life Business Club, providing more details on the project and what uh, the university is looking for, consortium. Consortium members, um, it's a nice uh, yeah, close this one. We'd like to thank everyone for all the positive support they've received so far for this initiative. Hashtag Bath Together, very on message, thank you. Very nice, uh, look out for that email, and we'll also promote through Creative Bath as well. The Bath, Bath, Bath Life Business Surgeries, these are bespoke deep dive sessions uh, showcasing companies' expertise through discussion. Please talk to us about how you might be involved. Frankly, we can all do with advice uh, and indeed new business. And the, the business surgeries will be continuing as virtual in the future, uh, and we'll have that enduring value via YouTube. Different thing, uh, Crumbs Takeaway. It's our virtual conference for the hospitality sector, coming up shortly, Monday, uh, April 19, as part of our Crumbs brand. It's shaping up really well. Some excellent participants lined up, keynotes, panel sessions, practical insights, and frankly, some truly heartwarming tales of the good that people do. Um, vital in these times, how hospitality businesses uh, have responded to support others during the pandemic. If you're in hospitality, please do, do join, it's free. And if you supply the sector and want to show your support, raise your profile, let's talk. We may be able to help uh, promote uh, your activities. Bath Life Awards um, will be held on 9th of September uh, in real life at the Assembly Rooms. Please note, nominations are closing next month, 13th of May, so look lively. Um, nominate for your business, for your teams, and for yourself. It's free, and there's great profile for our finalists, let alone, of course, subsequently the winners. The new thing here, uh, which is mentioned there, which is we're running a new grand reveal event on May 19th at midday, free again. 
All of the finalists will, will be revealed live for each category and on social media and on the awards site. It's just more drama around the awards. The grand reveal uh, is available for sponsorship and it's a great profile point. Uh, so please do talk to us if that appeals in any way. We do have a great roster of sponsors already, led very much by our headliners, uh, the Royal Crescent Hotel and Spa. If you're an ambitious company, one seeking to build your business pipeline, or you know, just simply show that you're proud to be a leading bath company, please consider it. There are 17 sponsors already committed, several other categories under discussion. Just the best celebration of business in Bath after this blooming year of all years. Bath Property Awards, quick shout for that, uh, out uh, back in real life, 22nd October at the Apex. Uh, months of marketing, all the good stuff, big gathering of property and pro services. Specific extra announcement, um, our business club sponsor, Mojas Druid, will also once again be the headline sponsor of the 2021 uh, Property Awards and our thanks to them. Yeah, other sponsorships available. But there's one more thing. Uh, I just want to take a, a few moments on this, um, which is a new venture by us called EntreConf. Entrepreneurs are central to this city. They have new ways of looking at the world, new business models, new services, new products, new jobs. And new opportunities thereby for advisors, investors, financial companies, lawyers, academic institutions, marketing agencies, and so many more. So we're launching EntreConf, the Entrepreneurs Conference. The future is unwritten. It'll be virtual this year on July 1st, and that with a real life dinner in the autumn and a full blown conference in 2022. It's pitched at startups, scale ups, and some may even be those future corns that break out big value players in years to come. It aims to give profound insight, valuable inspiration. It'll help catalyze partnerships, connect all parts of the value chain. It'll celebrate the special, very special contribution of entrepreneurs. And we're absolutely thrilled with the response uh, from a handful of briefings so far. We're gently going live. It's, it's quite clear that entrepreneurs generate excitement as well as opportunity. They're um, optimistic, good people to be around, clever thinkers and so on. And also that many will benefit from peer support. The site will launch shortly. Uh, it's probably going to be uh, Tuesday next week and full on comms will be powering out pretty soon. Please do talk to our teams about options to be involved in speaking to sponsoring. It's a chance to bring everyone together. Yeah, the future is unwritten. Okay, um, different thing, Bath Bulls uh, bounding back big time. It says with lots of bees on uh, July 23rd to 25th. Um, good times, great connections, and again, just the best way to raise terrific amounts of money for local charities. Please do get involved. You'll be in good company. Dozens of Bath businesses uh, will be there. Um, and related to that, please also look out for the, the Creative Bath Awards and the Summer Party happening just before the Bull on uh, July 22nd. Uh, nominations are open on the website for those awards too. Last up, Bath Life. Uh, we're, as ever, you know, incredibly proud to publish uh, this magazine. It's great fun celebrating a city and trying to do it in what we hope is a creative and supportive way. Um, but we, we just love the support we've had, uh, particularly uh, in these times, of course. So thank you. Right. Enough of all of that. Let's bring forward uh, some speakers. Um, you know, we've got a whole load of different companies here from business services and across the piece and so on. So let's hear from Simon Hall first, uh, General Manager of Hotel Indigo, uh, a major new £10 million development in Bath. Simon, how are you doing? Yeah, we're uh, we're obviously very excited for opening up again. Um, you know, it's been an, an interesting uh, an interesting few months for us. We opened a business and then closed it, um, and now are reopening up again. So, so yeah, very excited, very excited. Congra congratulations! We've got our first euphemism of the day. The interesting times. It's um, it's been interesting and challenging and multiple multiple other things. Um, but this this must be. Uh, this must essentially be happy days for you now when you can finally open and you can see, you know, all those years worth of work, uh, you know, you now have a chance to trade and then, of course, trade, uh, you know, strongly and profitably. Yeah, absolutely. It's obviously, um, you know, well documented our development uh, uh, ran over um, on time and budget. So we were kind of four years in the making. Um, and it was an interesting discussion that we had. Um, you know, with our owners to uh, make the decision to open in the first place, because of course we were in the middle of, of the COVID pandemic in uh, September last year when we opened. So there was lots of debate about, should we do it, shouldn't we do it? Um, but we decided to do it. Um, we'd waited long enough. Um, we'd seen some strong performance in the hotels, 
uh, our other hotels across the country um, last summer when, when hospitality was allowed to reopen again. So we took the decision to, to go for it. Um, and that was definitely the right thing to do. You know, we, we had some really, really strong pickup in the, in the first two months we were allowed to, to trade. So yeah, we're looking forward to that again. And of course, um, the big bounce back of hospitality really from the 17th of May. Yeah. Well, good, good luck to you with that and indeed everyone in hospitality. But just for those who are perhaps less familiar, just talk us through the offering and the scale of Indigo. So, um, yeah, our hotel is um, based down on South Parade. Um, if you, if those of you that don't know, um, it's essentially a 166 bedroom um, boutique hotel. Um, hotel Indigo is, a, is a, a brand that we franchise from Intercontinental Hotels Group. Um, Intercontinental Hotels have over 6,000 hotels globally, so a very big um, hotel um, brand owner. Um, but we operate the hotel under a franchise agreement of Hotel Indigo, which is really an upscale boutique brand. Sits perfectly within um, Bath and perfectly within our building. Our building is uh, uh, made up of about 14 different townhouses along South Parade and Pierpoint Street. Um, grade one listed um, and initially built in uh, the 1740s by John Wood the Elder. So, um, yeah, it's it's a it, the boutique experience, um, you know, lives in the hotel very strongly. Mm. So the, the the sheer complexity of fourteen townhouses, the, the previous uh, elements which have traded on that site uh, prior to these times, and then of course all all of the the COVID stuff. That's a complex piece of work. Um, but tell us this: we don't really want to dwell on the on that delay or necessarily even the complexity. But other than timing, what has changed uh, for Indigo compared with the plans? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess the, over the course of the development, there were there are other challenges that we came across and um, challenges with, with contractors and partners we used, amongst other things. We also expanded the plan. I mean, the original plan was just to use the buildings along South Parade. And then as buildings came along, available along Pierpont Street, um, you know, we were able to purchase those um, and incorporate them into the hotel. So, you know, part of the delay was our doing as well. But, you know, um, I suppose from the management of the business, then the big difference is, is uh, the change in the market. Um, Bath was obviously um, reliant on tourism mm -hmm. and a lot of international tourism and particularly where we would be pitching our business is to the higher end. Um, markets in in Asia, Australia, Canada, North America. Um, now we've had to relook at it completely because um, we know that they're they're not traveling. Um, a lot of the the international travel sort of would hub in London and and then move out to cities like Bath um, for sort of three, four days. And we know that that business isn't coming. So We've had to review um, the way that we sell the hotel, who we're selling it to, where our business is coming from, and, that, and that's been a big change because... And, and you know, it's, um, it's probably too simplistic to say that, uh, you know, one offsets the other, but clearly the, the overseas travel market, as described for all the obvious reasons, um, one would imagine is, is, is decimated and uh, maybe isn't a big part of your forecast in the near term. But the stay, staycationing Brits, um, you know, the uh, two, three day stairs and so on, are they, do they net out against each other or are you still expecting to be down on where you would otherwise have been? I, I, I really hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we've seen that, you know, when, we, when um, our hotels in other locations um, opened up last summer and we had, we've got uh, hotels in, in, you know, Winchester, Cambridge, Oxford, uh, Chester, you know, kind of similar-ish leisure destinations. Um, we saw them bounce back really, really quickly, and the staycation market is is definitely a help. And and to have a, a great hotel in a in an amazing city like Bath um, is is hugely beneficial. You know, we would much rather have it in the middle of Bath than in the middle of London at the moment. So, yeah. so yeah, well, I'm, I'm really optimistic that the domestic leisure market, the staycation market, will 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 um, deliver for us. Yeah. And of course, um, you know, th this being Bath, uh, other hotels uh, are, are available, as they say, but what makes Indigo better or, or different um, to its uh, competitive set? 
Well, I always like to say um, different. You know, the other hotels in Bath are a competition, but, you know, we're all friends. So um, um, it's important to say that. I think we have, uh, we have just have the balance between, um, you know, the power of an international company behind us um, and the branding. Um, but we, we're in a, a 300 year old um, Georgian terrace. Every room is different, every room is unique. Um, we also um, are fortunate enough to house um, the Elder restaurant down on, on the ground floor area of the building, um, you know, which has already um, opened up to literally critical acclaim. Um, some of the best food critics in the country have visited and written. If you haven't read Jay Rayner's uh, review in The Observer, then please do. Um, so yeah, we, we have the benefit of an incredible restaurant um, on site. Um, as well as fantastic rooms and, and steeped in history and character. Good, good. Well, last up, just on that elder point, and then we'll bring in our, um, our, our other panellists. Um, what, what are the near-term plans for the elder? Is it, uh, is it sort of restricted offer in any way, the number of covers you might be able to have, or how's it going to work? Yeah, well, I mean, we opened up under um, restrictions anyway, certainly from social distancing. So. The capacity of the restaurant was reduced by about 25%. Um, and then of course we were hoping, we will we'll be hoping to use the outside area because um, there is seating along um, the parade, on South Parade. So that's a that's a big, big benefit for us. It almost doubles the capacity um, when the outside space is full. So um, yeah, the short the short term is um, maximize where we can really. Well, uh, as mentioned, we wish you, uh, after, particularly after this journey, this has been a, a, a long old path to get to the point you are now of a, a major presence in Bath. Uh, yes, at a challenging time, which it is for every business, but we do wish you uh, and, and the big team you have there uh, all the very best in these thank times. You. So thank thanks, you. Uh, sorry. I missed you, yeah. Let's, uh, let's, so let's uh, keep you on, on screen time. Let's bring in our other uh, panellists. And as they're coming forward, just one other piece of news uh, I'd just like to bring to your attention. Uh, it's rather sort of a um, domestic one for us. Uh, Media Clash is, um, is delighted to welcome back uh, Steph Dodd uh, from Maternity Leave. Uh, she was our erstwhile events director, and she's coming back, or has come back, as our managing director. So uh, effectively, a new financial year, new times, and uh, new extra sort of uh, zeal and energy bring brought to bear across the piece. Anyway, talking of zeal and energy, let's talk with Anna first. Here we go. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to do this. You've got one minute maximum to tell us the elevator pitch on why you do what you do. Anna, go. Okay, so Cassia is a co-working cafe based on Bath Riverside. Uh, we opened in February, but our co-working offer actually opened this week. Um, what we're trying to do is blend the best elements of a cafe and a co-working space and a bar so that you're somewhere where you can either come and rent a desk for the day and work, or you can just pop in and we're a really uh, kind of office worker welcoming space. We're not going to try and move you on every five minutes. And then you can hang on and have a drink after work as well. And we're also going to be launching a fantastic programme of events in the autumn as a way of trying to bring everyone together. Uh, we're based on Bath Riverside, so we're a little bit out of the city centre, and that was deliberate because I think we felt quite strongly that lots of these big new developments that are happening in, in Bath and elsewhere are quite often heavily reliant on apartments which weren't necessarily designed with kind of COVID working in mind. And um, so we have lots of people that are using us as their kind of go-to office and go-to space. So we like to call ourselves the Cheers Bar of co-working. We want to be the place where everyone knows your name if you come and work with us. Um, I think Minute. The, Thank you. The, the cheers bar of co-working uh, that's a, it's a lovely phrase i didn't uh, didn't time you on that i am going to time all our others so there so i'm going to hit... under a minute actually greg i timed myself oh well done uh, Thank you. let's go for uh, the other simon one minute tell us why you do what you do hi um so my name's simon i'm one of the founders of can wine co and it's our mission to make the world's most exciting wines more accessible sustainable and convenient so we work with top producers uh, throughout Europe, but hopefully further afield in the future to bring really high quality wines to cans, which are much more sustainable, about a third of the CO2 emissions of a bottle, much more recyclable. Uh, and you can take them anywhere, enjoy them on a picnic, on the beach, on a boat, or just at home. There you are, 20 seconds. Very succinct. Well, you've got another uh, 30 seconds. So, so tell us, um, for example, what would be a, a typical retail price for, for one of the cans? 
Uh, so our kind of standard range cans are five pounds a can. And then we've got some really exciting limited editions coming forward, which are going to be six pounds a can. Right. And six pounds equates to how much drink? Not that I'm fixated on drinks. Anything else time. So three of them make up a bottle. So 15 or 18 pounds a bottle. Right. Good stuff. Um, wish you, and you're, you're, you're shipping and supplying currently. You're, you're in, in business as well. We are, yeah. We're in lots of independents. We're in about 18 independents around the country. Um, and we've just uh, just about to launch into late weights, actually. Oh, good news indeed. Okay, thank you, Simon. Let's, uh, let's hold for that. Let's go to Tim. Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm Tim from evershare.io. Um, we are a cashless donation service for charities using QR codes. Um, whenever the virus struck last year, I thought about the lady standing outside Tesco rattling her tin, trying to get some donations, and, and basically cash is gone forever now. And uh, basically, I thought, well, how can we fix this problem? So by using uh, QR codes with open banking, we've enabled the lowest cost donation service in the UK for charities. Wow. We're actually 75% uh, cheaper than using Visa, Stripe, or PayPal. Um, and uh, we only started there about six or seven weeks ago when we took our first four-figure donation, which was fantastic. So we're really, really happy about that. So you have your QR code on your T-shirt, on your website, um, in the shop window, wherever you want it. You just scan and click, and it makes a payment directly to the charity. So I'm really happy to be doing that, getting the charity signed up right, left, and center. Some really big ones starting to talk to us now. And, uh, you know, looking for some funding. So if anyone's got any spare money that they haven't spent in COVID, please send it my way, you know. Um, thank you. That's me. Very, very good. Um, I, I will take a little bit more time because of the charity element. Um, I mentioned the Bath Bull at the beginning. Tim, I don't want to bounce you publicly into something that may not work for you or may not work for us, but come on, there must be a deal to be done over the Bath Bull. We go around rattling the can. I'm sure we could do it more elegantly through. For you, it's free. For you, it's free. There you go. Did everyone hear that? Yeah, it's free. That's a contract. It's done. <laughs> okay, deal. I'll talk to you after. Yeah, talk with, to, please talk to us artists. If anyone else, uh, you know, far for me to say it, wishes to offer anything for free, you know, I'll have to consider it. <laughs> um, no, I won't. This is a charity thing for Bath Ball. Really good. Uh, good luck with that, Tim. We'll bring you back in a sec. Um, -da 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 -da. Vicky, go. Tell us about Frankenstein. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, I don't think I can do it in a minute. It's, it's brand new. Uh, so, hi, I'm Vicky from a world first attraction, Mary Shelley's House of Frankenstein. It was conceived by uh, two entrepreneurs who live in Bath uh, to basically say, why on earth is Mary Shelley not celebrated more in this city? Um, their background was in film and theater. So uh, we are creating, and there's only four of us, uh, building a, a world first attraction in Gay Street. Um, this will celebrate Mary Shelley's life. It will uh, bring to life the tragic tale and, uh, that she had uh, during her childhood that really reveals how the Frankenstein novel, which is now a global uh, icon, um, came to be. So we are set in a grade two listed property, uh, which gives us loads of challenges. Uh, but the idea is set over four immersive multi-sensory floors it will be full of uh, unique artifacts, vintage items, assorted body parts. Um, and we've also got a horror walkthrough basement and Victor Frankenstein's lab escape room. But more excitingly, for the first time ever, we will bring to life literally uh, an eight foot gruesomely beautiful monster exactly as Mary Shelley envisaged. So this is not the green, um, flat top, bolted necked monster that the world loves. This is the unique monster that Mary envisaged. So uh, oh. we're, oh. Vicky, I'm, I'm going to gong you out of that point, at the point of your, your, your gorgeous oxymoron of uh, gruesomely <laughs> beautiful. Who knew? He is. Um, do, do, sorry, one thing on this. Do, do tell us, when will you, and this is all subject to government guidelines and so on, when will you, you start trading? When can people actually go there? So we, we, our tickets are live already uh, on housefrankenstein.com, but our plan subject to guidelines will be mid-June opening. Right. I just oh. wanted to point out, Greg, that actually this whole thing was conceived uh, at the start of lockdown. So it's been a real challenge for us uh, to make this happen. But, uh, I, I'm sure that's an, uh, an element which uh, we'll pick up with our other panelists as well. But uh, Vicky, thank you for that. And uh, you know, good plug. It's um, 
Mary Shelley is, is just not uh, uh, sung as, as a hero, a heroine of, of the city uh, historically, uh, and it's a key part of the city's narrative, uh, and this does sound like a, an important new venture. Talking of important new ventures, let's go to Mark and Fabrizia. Let's hear from you. Preferably um, not muted, if that's okay. One, two, three, one, two, three. Right. <laughs> Okay. We don't have an elemental pitch, but um, we we had this um, this strong feeling that this is year zero, and everybody's kind of restarting on such new and unwritten. Like you said before, the future is unwritten. It's a new playground. There, there's going to be new rules, some of which we can kind of look at, and some of which are going to just come up, and we'll find out along the way. So um, everybody has the chance though to uh, show up at their best. So we do branding. Yeah. And um, so we help companies, especially small companies, uh, do exactly that and sort of refresh, renew. And we've actually had a lot of work this year because uh, people have taken advantage of the lockdown to say, you know what, when we come out, we want to just be like way better than, you know, the perception that you get through your brand and a stronger brand uh, really makes a difference in terms of, you know, clients are going to flock to you, hopefully. <laughs> and, 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 and Fabrizia, you, you're a photographer, a you're, you're a designer. Um, how, how does that work out in practice between you and how you, you pitch clients and create uh, great creative projects? Well, I'm a photographer and a business consultant, and I have a very strong sort of feeling about branding. He is I'm a designer, as you know, because I worked at your company Future a long yeah. time ago, and that's my yeah, my heritage is like for bits in Australia. I like working with people, finding out why they like doing things, and then making them look as good as they possibly can. So it's just you know, it's the worst time ever in the world to launch a business. I left Future after after 25 years as the lockdown started. Future have gone from strength to strength, like anything to video games or entertainment. Future done very well. We're launching a new business. It's it's a thrilling and exciting time. <laughs> oh, more euphemisms, I'm sure. Um, one last, you, you've obviously gone way over the minute, but there you go. Um, uh, I think you've got quite an interesting slogan or, or positional statement. Go on. Oh, my God, we can't forget it, love. <laughs> Say it. Good design is good business. Yeah. Good design <laughs> is good business and good luck with your new business. Uh, thank you. We'll talk with you shortly. Thanks. Uh, Sammy, uh, pitch away. Hi there. Um, well, I'm Sammy from Backpack. Um, and uh, Backpack and a consortium of partners works with organisations to help them benefit from authenticity in their brand inside and out. So um, it's interesting listening to uh, your playbook because I kind of do the bit before, if you like, in... Um, working with organizations to really help them understand what they are at their best um, to their external stakeholders, to their customers, their clients, their suppliers, and then internally in their culture. And by defining what they are at their best um, and what they can be at their best, and then sharing that and living it and bringing it to life, um, they can benefit and the people within the organizations benefit. So through performance um, and profitability, but also through staff retention and um, engagement. And Sammy, by all means, name drop a couple of clients if you fancy. Uh, well, I've worked with a couple of startups over the last year as well as existing businesses. So uh, in November, pretty much in the same week, uh, we launched uh, a new charity called Catalyst Foundation uh, with its first project, She, working with um, girls in rural Zimbabwe to remove barriers to education. That was awesome um, and still going really strong. We just um, had our first fundraising event through that. And also, uh, as I say, in the same week in November, it was a big week, uh, we launched Farley Performance, which is a joint venture with Bath Rugby and Bath Rugby Foundation, working on organisational performance. And again, going really strong. So it's, you know... Um, I hope uh, uh, one of my colleagues is, uh, is tweeting away merrily uh, about you and about the, this conversation, but also providing links to your businesses as well. Please, anyone tuning in, uh, you've heard the, the micro pitch, as it were, from each of these companies. Do check them out, check out their sites and see if it's something that um, appeals to you or you know people for whom it may appeal. Um, I did have a note which has mysteriously disappeared, but I'll say it anyway, it might be true. Uh, one of our very own clashes, Jake Hallwood, is actually in Cassia right now. Um, that was true then, it, it may still be true. It disappeared because I answered the question, Greg, which was a tactical error because it made it disappear. So I'm sorry, I'll, I'll stop fiddling with the Q&A, sorry. Oh, oh, really? 
Oh, panelists. Anyway, come on, panelists. Um, I'm going to chuck this question at you. Many business, uh, new business owners say starting a business is the hardest thing they've ever done, and act, frankly, far harder than they'd realised. Has that been true for you? Who'd like to comment? What's it been like individually for you? Sammy, you're, you're shaking your head. You're, you're disagreeing, are you? Yeah, I think deciding to start a business was the hardest thing. Actually doing it was far easier. Um, because I think the decision part was like, okay, so now when do you go? It's like going for a run, like putting your shoes on is the hardest bit. But once you're actually out there, you just have to survive. You just have to keep your eye on the ball and crack on. Um, so I think it was the decision that was the hardest bit, but doing it, you know, once you've jumped in, you're in. It's a, it's a piece of cake. It's a breeze. I mean, I'm putting words in your I mouth. I don't know about a piece of cake, but it... Egregiously. I, I think it's, you know, they say most startups fail because people stop doing them so if you don't stop doing it and you just crack on then it it doesn't necessarily get easier but it just carries on and you, and you and find the, what's right and what works for you there's a related point there that the zeal of a startup um you know a point at which that starts to ebb maybe when scale comes in in a company that's when companies can lose their sense of vitality and direction we'll be exploring that in much more detail at entreconf uh, july 1st ladies and gentlemen um come to come back to this point um talk about the from a personal point of view uh, what it has been like to start a new business in these times. I'm not looking for, you know, the, 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 uh, the hearts and minds sort of stuff, but tell me what it's been like individually. What have been the, you know, what's kept you awake at night? Yeah, Vicky, let's go. Uh, yeah, if I, so, so the really interesting thing I think I found is that when I joined the organisation, uh, as I said before, there's only four of us. Um, it was automatically in lockdown. So imagine trying to build an immersive visitor attraction when you can't physically get in the building to do that. Everything's done remotely. So it gave me sleepless nights and still does that are the plans that we've had on paper going to materialize in reality for the guest because it's all about the guest experience. So, so it's that whole remoteness away from our, our business that has been challenging from our point of view. And perhaps that, um, uh, for very simplistic, but perhaps that sense of breakout rooms is almost like a metaphor of what we've all been going through, all been trying to get out of this bloody time and so on. And perhaps you want to pivot the whole thing into be a, a corona experience. That's a terrible idea. I'm not suggesting that at all. <laughs> but, uh, tell us your thoughts in this area. Simon uh, Rollings. Yeah, so I, I, um, I handed in my notice on my previous job in January 2020 uh, and had a two-month lead time and then finished I think on the 21st of March and lockdown started on the 23rd. So I went into blind panic for about a month <laughs> um, and didn't know what to do because all of my customers closed uh, and our original launch plan was to go into events and, and outdoor activities. Um, so there was a real sense of this could not have happened at a worse possible time. If we'd been six months older, we might've had a bit more financial, you know, backing and sales behind us or, you know, six months into the future, uh, we might have just been able to delay things a little bit and, and do it post-corona. So we had to change everything we were doing, basically, and focus completely on direct-to-consumer, ditch the idea of doing trade for, for six months um, and doing events completely, which we still haven't done our first events, and, and it'll be going on 18 months before we do. Um, however, fast forward 12 months, I think what it did enable us to do is learn a lot very, very quickly that we wouldn't have been able to do in, in normal times. Um, and I think particularly on a local front, people were much more supportive of new businesses. There was a little bit more forgiveness. Um, so we had, a, I think, probably a free year, a get out of jail free card, where if you're looking to raise funding or um, looking at the performance of a business, we had nothing to compare it to. So everything we did last year was, was a plus. Um, we can't say we were down on the year before or anything like that. So reflecting on it now, I don't think it was quite as bad as it seemed at the time in March 2020. And I think it's enabled us to put everything in place to really accelerate and, and be successful this year and going forward. So swings and roundabouts, but quite an interesting experience. To there's, that, there's that interesting word again. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, just a thought, just a gentle thought for you. If you're at all interested in a very high profile event in the centre of Bath, which brings the whole of the city together and raises tons of money for charity, and you haven't done an event in 18 months at all, perhaps you might consider the Bath Ball. Uh, Sounds good. <laughs> enough of that. You that that is my own sales pitch. It's pretty crap. So t t tell me this uh, as uh, you know when you when you were thinking about your businesses, how much of this is 
How much of the motivation is a, a challenge that you want to test yourself? How much the motivation is to make money, uh, to do something cool, something new? What's your personal motivation in, in uh, starting these businesses? Can I jump in on that one, Greg? Yeah. Um, it was partly related to the previous question, actually. Cassia was quite lucky in that we were actually a response to the pandemic. So I think a lot of you guys had started businesses that were hit by it, but actually we were an idea that came about because of it. And I felt quite passionately as someone that already ran an existing business kind of nationwide, had lots of different offices, that it was really clear that how we work in the future was going to change and not just how we work, but how we kind of live work interactive. And so Cassia came about because we wanted to do something that responded to it. And so in a sense, we've been really lucky because we were only ever responding to the, we didn't have any grand plans pre COVID so everything's been exciting and new and different for us but for us there's a real energy around trying to create a really ethical hospitality business because I think hospitality can be really bad to its employees and in its suppliers and lots of other kind of things picking up on what Sammy does a really ethical business which really um kind of cares about its customers and wants to get to know them and understands that people increasingly make buying choices based on those kind of ethical value-based decisions. So something that knits together live work and knowing your customers and values, there's something exciting around that for us other than just running a space where we sell food and you hire desks. Thanks, I want to pick up that point in a moment. Let's uh, come back to others' sort of uh, personal motivation. Uh, Could I jump on that there, Greg? I mean, I yeah. agree that I see the, um, the, the coronavirus, leaving everything outside was was the challenge was also the opportunity it was because of the fact that the cash has disappeared from society that that's what gave me the idea to actually create this new or qr code cashless payment um uh, service for charities but then the downside was uh, the upside of zoom is great you can meet everybody and meet, have loads and loads of meetings but then the fact that so many charities are not working from their offices it's very hard to try and find the actual person who's going to make the decision so it's funny, it, it, in both ways, uh, it's been a blessing and I wouldn't say coronavirus has been a blessing, but the whole thing's been, you know, an opportunity as well as a, a challenge. But like everything, you know, like everybody here, you know, you just get over the challenge. As I said to my son the other day, you know, he said, it's pretty tough. He said, Dad, I'm not in the trenches. You know, I'm sitting watching Netflix having a beer, you know. So, you know, you have to think of the positive side of things. You know, this, is, this isn't 70 years ago. We'll get over it. We'll get out the other side, you know. Yeah, I mean, one other related positive is that um, we've we, none of us have been stress tested as much as we have, whether it's domestically, personally, or indeed commercially. Now, bring in Simon, then I'll come back to you, Mark, in a sec. Simon uh, Hall, it is. Yeah, actually, just on that on that um, point, Greg. One, the word of our lockdown has been resilience, mm. whether uh, you know personally or professionally. But I think answering the question, um, when we when we're looking at great hotels and great restaurants. Um, our primary objective is always to make something um, that's a bit different and that's cool and, and that people want to come to. Um, you know, we say on our website, awesome restaurants and bars, but ultimately that's what we're looking for. And our motivation isn't necessarily the, uh, to make money. Our, our motivation is to make something great that people want to come to and then the money will look after itself. So, so that's always our first approach is, is What's the city? What's the area missing? How can we fill that gap? And, and let's do something that's really cool. And, and to, to, to frame that in a, in a slightly more uh, generally applicable way, it's concentrate on excellence of whatever your discipline is. And the consequence of that will be a, a growing business. Mark, is that, um, does that chime with you or are you going to make a, a different point? No, absolutely. Because I think um, when you asked the question, it gave me a chill as I realised I've got no entrepreneurial spirit whatsoever. <laughs> Certainly felt that uh, the imposter syndrome, but I think it made it made you know it's really helpful to make me realise that we started the business because it was so much fun watching Fabrizia coach photographers and get them to when people get better and encouraged to get better at something it's like being at school or something to see someone become better than they expected and that sense of confidence. And so when we just started trying it as a side hustle, just like, well, let's rebrand them as well, because for God's sake, they need rebranding, no offence to all of their, <laughs> their cousins and brothers who do logo design. But then the, it's that dual thing of when you, um, when you make someone feel that good about themselves and make them feel better, it is, you know, it's really, really rewarding. I'm, I'm so cynical, I don't want to admit that, but... It does make me feel really happy when you see people that Fab's worked with for years who are just suddenly winning awards and 
making a huge amount of money, you just think, well, you know, we helped to do that. You know, we helped give her the confidence to do it. So it's a, it's you know, the altruist. It's like Simon said as well earlier. There's, there's a one good thing about COVID is it's there's a lot of goodwill and sincerity out there, and whatever the challenges are, which are immense. I'm reaching out to people, you know, even to, you know people such as yourself, and it's incredible the 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 level of kindness and sincerity amongst people. You know, it's it's as though you know the, the there's that phrase that we're we're all in the same storm, but perhaps in different boats. That this this whole experience has sort of stripped away some of the frankly the bullshit which uh, which inevitably will surround some business areas. People wishing to be tending to be I don't know different or better than they are. It's humanity. We are all sharing this and we're all figuring our way and if we can help each other and of course get benefit in some way, reputationally or financially, whatever, or simply just the enjoyment of seeing others succeed as you've talked about, then happy days. On the imposter syndrome, uh, I'll just give you this uh, thought back. Everyone has that, but very few admit it. No one knows anything. We're all just simply making it up and giving it a go. If it works, do more of it. If it doesn't, don't do it. And there's much more to business than that, but don't worry about the imposter syndrome. Few will admit to it, but everyone has it at some point. Um, let's let's come to a financing point. Um, this is from uh, our good friend, very good friend, anonymous attendee. Uh, what different ways did you go about sourcing funding for your business to get them started in the first place? How much was self-funded? Indeed, self-funded stroke friends and family and so on. <laughs> and let's talk about that. Yeah, uh, Vicky, let's take that. Uh, so uh, just a really interesting point. My, my background was corporate. I never really want to go to corporate ever again. Uh, but this entire investment um, has been funded with private investors. So uh, just a really interesting uh, experience that I had and, and the team have had is trying to find those investors during lockdown because trying to sell an idea to somebody that, that ultimately ours will be a franchisable model uh, is really difficult when, when you can't physically see the building or give them a sense of it. So, so the entire project has been uh, private uh, backed. So it's it's a lot a lot resting on making it brilliant for them. So, can you yeah. um, can you give uh, share some idea of scale? How much financing it is, and are these um, sort of angel investors or institutional investors? Well, these these are just that they're they're basically anybody who buys into our idea. It doesn't it doesn't matter who who they are, and I think that's really lovely. Uh, it, it's about there's a lot of uh, personal friends that have invested, uh, local businesses, but predominantly it's it's all. Uh, people in and around Bath and the region which is great um, and you know without giving any away any figures to be perfectly honest this entire project has been done for well under a million pounds so um, it's all about love sweat and tears that have gone into that and and some really great creative thinking. Yeah well I'll, I'll just echo the point from previously we wish you and uh, everyone uh, all, all the very best you've, you've you're each taking different types of risk and risk is Risk is not sort of, you know, some is more or less. It's a bit, it's 100% to what it is to you individually or financially. And uh, it's impressive that you're doing this. Anna, you're going to, you're going to talk about financing. Well, only because I'm the, I'm the opposite of Vicky. I would have loved to have some investors. Um, ours was mainly funded through kind of personal kind of finance, um, including a fantastic loan that the British Business Bank is offering. If anyone wants to Google that, I could a startup loan. But we also did crowdfunding, which we found really, really useful in terms of engaging uh, potential customers ahead of time. So that was really useful. But, um, I have to say, having run a consultancy previously, which is easy to, to start, you own a laptop and you start it. And the amount of money required for starting a hospitality business was slightly terrifying. And I possibly rather naively thought you could still rock up to your bank and chat to your bank manager and they'd offer you a loan but banks are very clear that they weren't lending anything to start up to this point so that was a little bit of a surprise and we'd certainly like to scale Cassia up we're looking at some sites in Bristol Brighton um, and same as Tim if Tim discovers any great rich investment investors if you could pass them on to me that <laughs> because uh, we love them too I think like a, a naked pitch and I'm guilty of that myself and um, just just tell me uh, a little bit about that uh, that that financing um uh, crowdsourcing for those who don't know just to step through the the process who does what who gets what what it means for you as an organization 
so we used a website called crowdfunder which is pretty well known and what we did was we offered um, actual tangible things people could buy ahead of time so it's a bit like buying a gift voucher so they could buy a coffee and cake scaling right up to they could buy 10 days um, desk co-working or whatever and um, so that was our model and that worked really well because most people want to come in and redeem them and that's great and that gets you customers some people a bit like gift vouchers don't redeem them so it's kind of free money um, and also at the time NatWest were doing a great scheme called back her business which um, would kind of match fund what you raised if you were a female owned business that was fantastic but other companies have used crowdfunding a bit like Brewdog did you can actually buy a share in the company ahead of time um, and that's certainly a model we're looking at potentially for future Cassias is we can demonstrate we have one up and running well it's more feasible to ask people to invest in, in some future ones so that's an exciting chance but I would really recommend crowdfunder it's well worth the time and energy that you, you put into it. Good, good. It's also, um, to precise on that Brewdog point, it's worth checking the, the Brewdog story for those who don't know it about how they have, it's helped define the brand and actually bring people into, into the family or whatever uh, of just a, a very maverick approach to, to beer, cons beer production, consumption and marketing. Uh, well worth looking at. Let's come on to, um, this, this may less apply to, uh, may not apply to any of you, but who knows. Um, Advisors uh, will, will nearly always say it's never too early to start planning your exit. You think, bloody hell, I've only just started. <laughs> but anyway, they do, they do tend to say that. Um, do you agree? Are any of you thinking along those lines about potential exit? But I'm looking at uh, Simon Rollins, maybe. That's, uh, um, uh, I, I would guess that you've got something at the back of your mind about funding rounds, build scale, and um, run off into the sunset. True? Uh, true. Um... But it was all thrown spatter in the works uh, at the beginning of last year. I think one thing I've learned is that um, I think we rushed trying to get investment first first time around a year ago, um, and actually we're better positioned to do it now. Um, so whilst it's great to have a plan and, and to have that thought through, particularly when you're chatting to investors, because that they want to know that you've thought through the process, um, thing, things change. Um, you know, if you don't need to go to equity funding to scale up, then great use it for growth or or something else but we're a, we're a product business so a lot of our funding is actually around um sourcing and, and holding stock which is not necessarily something you want to use equity finance financing for um so you you, you presumably want to use debt financing because it's uh, as much as anything else it's a cash flow issue uh, i'd imagine it's a cash flow issue exactly yeah, yeah which would um, inhibit so, growth or, or define growth in some way yeah so you know ideally we want to uh, use debt or, or just um, bootstrap it for our production and then use equity finance for kind of scaled growth so to put behind marketing and brand and um, you know expansion internationally and things like that uh, rather than just generally cash in the business. If, um, if, if I bounce you all on this point um, as long as you're all, all okay with this we will share each of your emails with each other because I suspect there's sort of you know there's some degree of commonality here um, as long as you're all okay to play nice and you're not going to introduce any GDPR rules, uh, we'll do that subsequent to this so you can you know, pick up any conversations. Tim, you're going to say? Uh, yeah, just also as well, um, I'd encourage everyone to look at grants. Um, there is, you know, fairness to the government, there is a huge amount of grants available out there. Um, Innovate UK, uh, we got a grant from them. We're really thankful for it. It was absolutely brilliant. But you know, there's so many other uh, organizations like the European uh, EEN and the Southwest Creative. There's loads of them. I'll, I'll put a list together, but they're really, uh, in fact, if anyone wants, I have a, a database of every single grant that's funding body and organization available. Oh, UK. our whole rationale has, has been delivered in that one phrase there. I have a whole database. I mean, unbelievable. Um, can, can we have that too, please? We yeah, will... yeah. Oh, oh, no problem. <laughs> it's just, just basically it's a compilation of every... I mean, there's a grant for everything. Um, I saw so once a grant for a thousand pounds to teach disabled people in Newcastle how to play tennis. There you go. Great. That's wonderful. But there is literally a grant for everything. And there's loads of support networks and people shouldn't have the attitude. Oh, I'll never get the grant. Well, if you don't apply for it, you don't get it. So you have to try and go for it. Um, and there's a load of support out there. Lots of support. So I'll make that available to whoever wants it. Great, great stuff. We'll find a way, uh, I, I, I don't know how, but we'll find a way, if you're okay to promote that uh, more widely to, to those on the, the Bath Life Business Club, uh, we'll probably put it on our LinkedIn post, but we'll talk about that uh, subsequently. Um, very promising. Sammy, what about you in terms of either, either grants or, uh, you know, potentially thinking about uh, an exit and what you might be doing beyond uh, Backpack? An exit strategy? Well, um, it's a really interesting one because it comes back to your point before around motivation um, and 
I've had lots of people over the last year in coaches and things say to me, you know, so how is it that you're earning money while you sleep or how are you going to productize this or how are you going to do that? And, um, and I think I've got to the point where I'm kind of cool that I'm not, I'm probably not. Um, I, I started backpack because I really believe that a lack of authenticity makes people miserable. Um, you know, when we work in businesses that feel two faced, when they're one thing externally and something different internally, it just feels rubbish as a, as a colleague and, and it's not everything that the business could be. So I, I really love working with organizations and helping them be all that they can be. And, and I can't see a way that I'm ever going to be able to put that in a box and say, and here's how you go through that process. Thank you very much. Because, because people are people and, and the conversations are all unique. And so the short answer is I probably won't. I'll probably just try, have to try and save up at some point in order that one day it stops, I guess. But um, I think knowing that from here and rather than trying to work out how to productize it is I, I'm OK with that right now. Cool. Let's, um, let's move on. We're, we're, there's only 10 minutes or so to go. Um, let's come on to values. I'm going to ask uh, Simon Hall uh, in, to kick off this. In some ways, in fact, in many ways, lockdown has made everything more local. Uh, that we are, we have traversed our cities, we've explored them, we've engaged with them, we've seen them anew, uh, you know, because we've not been able to do anything other than that, essentially. But I think that points that Sammy's touched on and others about authenticity, local provenance and so on. How significant do you think that is, Simon, for your business? Because your business, as, you, as you've described, is, is, you know, straddles other very broadly similar cities. That level of engagement with the city, is that now more important than it was uh, previously? Yeah, I think it's really, really important because, um, you know, one of our primary objectives as a hotelier is to enhance anybody's experience of the neighbourhood that they're coming to stay in. So um, it, it's really important when people come to Bath that they they um, get an experience of, of the whole area and what the area has to offer when they're in our hotel. And so, you know, we purchase locally, we have local, um, you know, locally produced toiletries, etc. Uh, locally produced drinks. Um, we've got great provenance in the restaurant, you know, everything sourced very locally. And that's really, really important. And it's important because it's getting back to the points that we just discussed, is that, is that authenticity in a business is really important. And when customers have choice, customers know, and your guests, our guests pick that up. You can't, you can't, as Sammy just said, you can't say you're one thing and then when a guest comes to your business, they experience something else. So, yeah, if you, it's important and more so because authenticity is more important as there's more choice. And that's, um, I mean, that's a real challenge for, for major national, uh, international businesses, that sense of authenticity and personality that it's, you see, and without naming which, there's one of the, the large supermarket chains invented some farms that sounded sort of local and uh, you know nice and so on it, it, it's just bullshit and and people see through that there's something called the net which helps you see through bullshit where do you where do you everyone else where do you see that that point out authenticity and localness uh uh you know um coalescing for your business maybe maybe anna on that one um, I think, I'm not sure where I see it coalescing, I just think that it's a really commercially, I know authenticity is important and you should do it because you're authentic, but it's also really commercially good and useful to be authentic and to have these kind of values. I think they're quite often seen, I mean, I come from a background in the house building industry where it's a lot of, if I may say, kind of hairy blokes who don't quite see what authenticity or values have to do with them, I'm not knocking the hairy blokes. I was trying to say hairy ass builders and I thought it was too... Oh. Um, there's also kind of, don't, don't see the point in authenticity, but actually it really helps commercially. If you have a company that is values aligned and is living those values, people make those choices based on that thing. You, you retain staff, for example, one of our values at Cassia is excellence in employment. If we are a really good employer, we will be able to recruit the best people in Bath and we will be able to retain the best people in Bath. And that only helps our business. So I'm, I'm just interested in the fact mm. that being authentic is actually a commercially really good thing to do as well, even though that slightly undermines the idea of being authentic. But, yeah, but, I, but I think that's so often the case. It's, uh, you know, do things for good reasons and there's benefit. And exactly. That's a much more a coherent way of saying what I was just trying to oh, say. Not at all. It's an or, or it's an angels and devils point. You, you do one thing and some may say, well, that's, you know, that's done for that reason. No, it's done genuinely and there's benefit. Let me come to, to Simon, Simon Rollings in this one. Um, related to that authenticity point and one hopes in, in your favour, you build scale, et cetera, et cetera. 
How are you envisaging maintaining your, your personal founding zeal as well as one, you know, one imagines a much larger business and its values as you build scale? Doesn't, you know, personal value go out of the window when uh, scale is built? I hope not. You can ask me in a few years. Um, <laughs> we, we, the way we've kind of um, designed the brand and the way that we want to build and expand our range, um, we've kind of, from the very start, understood that we're going to have limited um, volumes of every line that we do because we're working with, you know, independent producers. There's, um, it's not beer. You can't just scale up and continue to to make more and more. It's wine, so it's annual and it's it's slower, and we have to. It does grow on trees, I suppose. It does grow on trees, literally. Um, And there's been a big frost this week, so this year's English harvest uh, might might not be very successful, and that happens throughout the world um, regularly. So you have to kind of work around that. And so the way we've designed the brand, the way we want to focus on sourcing is is about working through that. So we've built a system around styles of wine. And so if if one particular wine... um, you know, has limited stock, we can bring in another wine that's as good or better, that fits that same profile, but it's not going to be the same as, as the one you got before. So it's not a homogenous product. It's not going to be the same every time you drink it. Um, it's going to change year on year on vintage and things like that. So um, that's how we plan on scaling. That's how we, we, you know, we want to do it and retain that quality without having to just go to who can produce the highest volume. It's, um, it, it's sometimes the case that uh, what begins uh, as a sort of um, a strangely shaped business with odd rough surfaces and so on, uh, often in, a, in their, their founder's image almost, careful as I'm saying that, over time, those, those rough edges get polished off and it ends up an entirely normative business, exactly like all the other normative businesses. So you know, my, my observation back would be just to, to maintain the point of difference, to find the point of difference, maintain it throughout and keep to that founding zeal. Um, Fabrizio, yes, you're, you're, you're waving. Oh, you're on mute as well. Um, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, in a market where they're saturated with similar products, because, you know, a lot of people do a lot of the same stuff that, that everybody does, um, the key factor is to create an emotional connection with your client. This is what your brand, you know, good branding does. And the emotional connection is based on your values you're, you're showing up as yourself. You have to draw your clients into your story. That's what people go for. You know, when Anne was saying, you know, this is what, this is how we're going to found it. And she's going to be talking about it throughout, you know, her, her everything, communication. And so those values that keep going out to people who, you know, have, you know, bump into us along their way. And then they identify with that because I am very, very, you know, passionate about businesses that run ethically or environmentally friendly or all inclusive or whatever it is that we we everybody has their own values and when we find a company that has that same little point of connection that's it you know we're going to go there and not somewhere else doesn't matter about the price as much as it's a bit more expensive we don't really shop on that unless it's for you know things that are not important so Absolutely. Can, can, I, can I just put you on the spot? Um, uh, I'll paraphrase it by saying, I'll preface it by saying it's a bit unfair, but I'm still going to do it. Um, are there, for you, you as, a, as a duo, are there companies or organisations, without naming them, that you simply wouldn't worth, work with because they don't perhaps share your values or because you're in a formative stage, you've just got to take business from wherever you can get it? Fabrizio's got the conscience, so I'll leave her to <laughs> there's, there's absolutely things we won't want to work for. Or work for. And, and I've been talking to, you know, pitching to a new client this week, and I you know had an uncomfortable position for me because Fabrizio tends to do the pitching, but I realised as I was talking to someone that there's, there's no point in working with someone unless you're proud of it because the job we're doing now is the one we're going to show to our next client and say, look what we did. So you can't have, there's, there's no point in, in doing something that you can't feel proud to be associated with both. That's, um, I mean, that's a point which pretty much applies across the board, I'm sure, but it's, uh, it's, it's very eloquently expressed. We are coming towards the end. I just want to pick up two points. So the first one is that, um, do you think that what is talked about as this shift to more thoughtful collective values will actually endure and then does that inform and benefit what you do? Or is this this weird bubble we're in and eventually we'll just go back to doing what we were doing pre-COVID? What's your thoughts? Enduring values of thoughtfulness. 
Well, I think brands have been doing this for a very long time. I mean, the whole marketing has been, you know, based on storytelling for the past 20 years. You know, Coca-Cola used to say, drink Coca-Cola, enjoy Coca-Cola. It was a blasting advertising for years and years and years. And then they started having people around the, you know, the bonfire stringing guitars and, well, there's the Coca-Cola storytelling. And then if you identify with that Sunday lunch or that uh, bonfire group of friends, uh, you're gonna, you know, going to buy the products. That's on a huge scale, but on a smaller scale, it absolutely works. People are gonna come to us because they like us. And I work with people that I like. And more and more people, there's, I think the middle market of people don't care, it's, it's going to have a bit of a problem because we are the shop for commodities, like, you know, the lowest, you know, we don't want to spend much money. So it's like, you know, buy online or something. Or we want to find something that is really nice and unique. And that, the story of that product really plays a big part. And if you think about all the artisan stuff that's been coming on the past few years, this is not COVID related. It's It's been going on for a while. I think this year has just, you know, exploded it even more yeah, the, uh, the 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 great the great pause has also been the great accelerator and I, i'm sure that point is something at uh, simon summon hall with, uh, with indigo that sense of you know narrative story context is exactly at the heart of uh, you know your offering essentially it's these you know, extraordinary townhouses um remade exactly for instance oh, I, so, so oh so that, well Sorry, that's anyway a, that's a simon. I, yeah. I with clients and we usually go and sit in a, a sort of wonderful hotel around the world wherever we are and spend the day together and to me like now people will come here I'll definitely go and hit something like Indigo rather than another place because the story of the place ties in with what I'm about where I'm about and if we're in Bath where else do you want to go you know it's it does make sense to make every local thing part of your story as well. You, you should each have a go, not now, you should each have a go at pitching the other business on their behalf. But anyway, we'll come to that. So Simon, your, your, your thoughts about that, about those enduring values, localness and so on, being yet more central to, to your offering. Yeah, well, I mean, it's part of, a, it's part of what, um, you know, the brand, I guess, kind of stands for. One of the big sort of paradoxes is, how do you have, do you have a boutique brand? How do you have a local brand? that Because, you know, brand by the nature of it is something that, it, that, that promotes, you know, on a global level, certainly within within our business, um, and that's absolutely how you do it. If is is the Hotel Indigo as a brand, um, one of the the core of the brand is neighbourhood, and neighbourhood runs through the DNA of the brand. And whether your neighbourhood is in is in Bath or whether your neighbourhood is in in Venice or New York or anywhere else, then the neighbourhood the neighbourhood runs through the essence of the hotel, not just in the buildings or the the interior design but in the product and the knowledge that the guests uh, that the team have to enhance the guest experience of that neighborhood in, you know, and, and in the local local procurement as well and and that's how you do local on a global scale <laughs> and that's yeah. what we're trying to create without with our brand so Sammy uh, one, one last year then I'll give the, the last, ask the last question please well I, just just this the point that I think you're making about being um, being true to who you are and I think sometimes we think that means we have to be altruistic or holier than that or very you know whatever that means it it's great if we are but you look at some of the brilliant brands who have absolutely performed through being who they are and it's none of those things look at pot noodle right there's zero nutrition it's it is the guilty pleasure of snacks but by coming out and saying hey we're we're a terrible snack do you want some they were exactly who they who they wanted to be and they didn't pretend to be anything other than that so i think the key to authenticity is not trying to work out what's really great and holy about you but just what is it about you and then be that so with hotel indico if you just went into every city and said we're global but everywhere we are in the world we try and be as local as possible that's still an authentic story um yeah so i just think it's just being who you are not not trying to be too good if that makes sense I'm sure um, uh, Pot Noodle will be very grateful for the uh, the backhanded compliment <laughs> the <plug>. you gave them. <laughs> their, their business is transformed by that, I, I'm sure. But the point is is very uh, sensibly made, so, so thank you. Last question, two elements to it. Just dive in with any thoughts on this. One, who gave you smart advice? And secondly, if you had one piece of advice to give to people watching this uh, live or on YouTube who are considering starting a new business, what would that advice be? Fabrizio. 
No, you're on mute again. My advice to you is not be on mute. There you go. Well, we, did, we have kids coming and going. We didn't want oh, yeah. surprises, but no start before you're ready. I know it sounds controversial, but that's the best piece of advice I've ever had. And that's what I give to all of my clients. Not that you don't do the due diligence to work out your numbers and work out your stuff. That's not what I mean. But I have seen people just going over it and going over things and, and, and delaying and, and perfecting and doing, you know, there comes a point where you just set a date, you just go for it, you go for it. And like um, Sammy said before, you know, you just go and push and get it, you know, get it to work. We play until I win and you just go for it. Because if you wait until you're ready, you're never ready, never ready. Perfection, so perfection is the enemy of progress. Absolutely. Yeah, whatever. Um, Anna, some advice that you've been given, perhaps, or, or you'd wish to give? Well, I've been given tons of great advice. I'm actually struggling to, to select one bit from all the amazing people I've spoken to. But my main very boring bit of advice to other people would be do your budgeting very carefully and then quite literally double the number that you came up with at the end and assume that that's going to be how much money you need to start off with. Sorry. Okay. Du double the, the, the cost line, not double the revenue line. Double it? the cost and then possibly add the number you first thought of as my friend. Yeah. Let's be absolutely clear, the avoidance of doubt. Um, uh, caution on revenue and be, be very, very liberal, as it were, on costs. I'm sure is right. Any further points of advice you either have been given or, or wish to give? Make sure you have a good team. Always have, a, always have a good team. Make sure you, if, you, if there's something you don't know about, don't try and bluff it. Try and find the person who knows what we're talking about get together give out shares make it work don't sit there thinking as, as someone said earlier on waiting for it to happen make it happen and worry about all that stuff afterwards but make sure you have the team first definitely just, just, just one specific piece of advice on that team point i mean of course we're all thinking well that has to be true how do you go about selecting the right person for a role or right uh, organization if it's uh, outsourced for me uh, well, I've gone through so many different people. It's incredible. It's so hard to find the right person. But when you find the right person, you, you know who that person is. Um, and you just go with your guts. If in doubt, throw it out. You know, if, if you have any doubt about um, what that person, their, their, their morality or their ethics or whatever it is, just don't work with them. If you have that, if you go, you go with your guts. And if every time I've gone with my guts, I've lost every time. So I'm not doing that again. So just go with your guts. And, you know, th there's a great network. You know, LinkedIn is fantastic, by the way. And I should say everybody you talk about, you know, Evershare, everyone working together is, you know, use LinkedIn, support each other. You know, if someone makes a post, tweet it, repost about it, or whatever those things are, you know, you wouldn't believe that. There's, you know, there's 88,000 thousand of us in Bath. You know, you can actually expand that message. You know, it's, it's just a like, it's a tweet, it's a repost. Just do it. You know, just it, it does actually work. It just... If everybody in this show here, there's all about 40 people times 40, well, someone do the maths for me. It, it can expand the message very, very quickly. More, basically. Um, I think I saw that Simon, Simon H, you, you're going to say uh, something. Yeah, I was, just, I was just picking up on Tim's point is my piece of advice on team is make sure you're not the cleverest person in the room. And too, too often as leaders, you your ego takes over. Um, and um, one thing I always try and do is make sure I sur surround myself with experts. You know, my job title is, is general for a reason. And uh, yeah, that, that's my advice. Salutary advice indeed. Mark, did you have a, a last thought? You just... Um... It was just one last thing to add really to what's been said about, and, and you know, LinkedIn is absolutely amazing. It's so good to connect with people. You know, I think the one piece of advice I have is just, as well as the connecting with LinkedIn, it's just like, look at your local community as well. I think local contacts are so... I'm lucky because I've worked in Bath over 20 years. I've made a lot of connections, but it's easy, and I've done it myself recently, I've fallen into a, a social media trap of desperately trying to get likes on Instagram and just get this huge nebulous distant audience of people to follow. It's just like it's been much more rewarding and better business to speak to people local and and build up relationships that way the lockdown makes everything local it accelerates trends which are in place previously um unless there are further last comments from any of our panelists closing comments at all uh, sammy are you, are you waving yes, i may um i think one of the things that's really important at starting up is to work out the bits that you're precious about and the bits that you're not mm -hmm. so where have you got room to flex and wiggle and have a conversation and compromise and what are your hard no's and I think defining those will just save so much time and energy 
on having conversations where actually Tim I trust my gut to my gut would have told me originally just to say no to that so I think working out what you're precious about is really important Good advice across the piece. I think we are going to have to close it there, if that's OK. Um, thank you to all of our speakers today and founders of really promising new businesses. Uh, Simon Hall with Hotel Indigo, Indigo it's the, the oldest new business in town in many ways, but it is now a, effectively a new business. And after your journey particularly, your organisation's journey, we really do wish you all the best. But Anna Sabine of Cassia, uh, Mark Wynn and Fabrizio Costa of Your Playbook, uh, Sammy for Backpack, um, Sammy Burt for Backpack, Simon Rollings, Can Wine Company, uh, Tim Hegarty, Evershare, uh, Vicky Smith, Ma Mary Shelley's House of Frankenstein, uh, a major new attraction for Bath uh, available soon. Good luck to all of you. Uh, thank you to everyone watching uh, for your time and, and indeed some of the questions we've had. Thanks, of course, to our business club sponsor, Mojas Jurit, uh, and for all of you watching today and your, your general support for Bath Life. Uh, we, we love publishing magazine. We love bringing people together. Uh, and it's great to see there's, there's some form of resonance. Look out for the, the various business clubs. We are having our special crumbs takeaway on April 19th, which is quite soon. And of course, directly related to this area, of course, EntreConf, our major new conference for entrepreneurs on July 1st. The future is unwritten. Good luck to you all in the coming months. This has been a Media Clash production, and this has been the latest Bath Life Business Club. Bath together, always. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.